Sometimes it's the very people who no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. Humanity does this to us. Not if we show them a better path. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. One of the things that you get in The Deep Young is the idea that the archetypes sort of aren't exactly totally outside of time and space because they evolve culturally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where we might talk about like the axial age or something, Jung tags this stuff, you know, with sort of these 2000 year, right, right. you know, procession of the, yeah. right, whatever this is called, the cosmic seasons, right. no, cosmic months, or something, something like, that. like that, whatever, right. it's astrology. Right. So, so he identifies these like 2000 year long cycles. And one of the things that he says in the answer to Job, so right story of Job, you know, for, for, did you do Job in the series? No, I didn't. Okay. So the story of Job, right? It's, it's a late Old Testament, um, story. And what you have is God and the devil are sitting around on a mountainside. This is before they were like, God and Satan. Or, what did I say? The devil. Oh yeah. Okay. Satan, you're right. It was still a job description. Yeah. So God and the adversary, the angel that does the adversarial stuff are sitting on the side of a mountain and basically they get into an argument about whether or not, uh, if sufficiently bad things happen to Job, God's faithful servant, Job will denounce him and they take bets. You know, Satan's like, I bet you I can make his day sufficiently terrible, right? This is just like the bet in uh, the dark night, right? Yeah. One bet, one bad day. Uh, we're all one bad day. So, so they make this bet and God's like, you're on. And then with sort of God's go ahead, he destroys Job's life, gives him disease, kills his children, ruins yeah. his fortune. And, you know, the, the original text uses this as an opportunity to really plumb some of our deepest sort of questions and concerns and anxieties around why do bad things happen yeah, to good it's, people? It's, it's the problem, it's the problem of suffering and evil. Totally. Problem of suffering and evil. And then there's this final scene towards the end where there's no answer, but God appears out of the world. Yeah, God. So, so Job is sitting around and talking to his buddies and he's starting to get a little bit, you know, yeah. like, right. And then God suddenly appears from the whirlwind and God delivers this speech, which, um, it's very interesting. It's like he basically questions Job's knowledge. He says, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, canst thou draw Leviathan up with a hook? He brags about creating these giant monsters. And being able to defeat them. And being able to defeat them. Didst thou lay the foundations of the earth? Basically, God is like, you, fuck you, you, oh, well, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, you, you just have no idea what you're talking about, you ignorant worm. I'm the creator of the universe. But, okay, I, 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 I don't want to take too much steam out of, I mean, some people have interpreted that is that what God's doing is inducing a numinous experience. And, the, and, the, and, Part of the response yes. to the problem of evil is not a, any kind of philosophical proposition or argument, but it's like, look, here's the numinous. And you go, it's like, it's, right. like that, it's like that scene in Joe versus the volcano. You know, oh God, whose name I do I not know, thank you for my life, because he sees the numinous. Right, right, right. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't answer the fact that he believes he has some kind of brain cancer. It doesn't resolve any of his problems, but he becomes grateful for his life because of the encounter with the numinous, and that's the answer. Right. Be beautiful and terrible like the sea, yeah, all who yeah. look on me shall love me and despair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for, for sure, it, I think that's one aspect. But the thing that Jung tags on specifically okay. is this particular exchange, because what Jung reads into this is this kind of encounter where it's like, Job basically did nothing to deserve this. Yes. And after the encounter, where Job does kind of knuckle under, God feels remorse. Ah. We have a kind of an Old Testament figure, because, you know, Old Testament God is a funny, capricious figure, right? You read Genesis. The, and Gnost the Gnostics made a big deal exactly. of this. Exactly. And yeah. so this is a very Gnostic interpretation. Right. We have sort of old Nobo Daddy, right. right, who's throwing his weight around in the Bible, like, you think I'm just a hill god? Snakes for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, right? We have this Old Testament God that's hard to deal with, hard to reconcile, right? Hard to chew through. And this is part of the Gnostic problem. And in the Book of Job, Jung sees a moment where that God feels remorse. And that, for him, is the moment where it's necessary to then incarnate in the flesh so that you can suffer. He sees that as the transmission book into Christianity. Right. That's just heresy. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally <laughs> right? Totally. That is not a conventional <laughs> Orthodox Christian idea.
in any way. Right. So the idea it's deeply that, Gnostic, though. Very deeply Gnostic. So, yeah, no, I think Jung is, you know, whether or not he would have had the courage all along to say that he was a Gnostic, because he was already sort of plastered with a lot of labels as a weirdo. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether or not he would have had the courage, I mean, one of his earliest works around the period of the Red Book is The Seven Sermons. Yeah, I tried, yeah. I tried reading some of that. It's very hard. Well, it, you know, it reads like a Gnostic text. Yeah. yeah and yeah, trying does. to read the Gnostic Gospels. is very tough. Like, Except for the Gospel of Truth. Or the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel, okay, the Gospel of Thomas is pretty good because it just puts like a clarifying spin on the synoptic Gospels. Mm. It's like nice little aphorisms, that's good. But like, you know, perfect thunder mind. A thunder perfect thunder mind. perfect mind. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, a bunch of those other ones where it's like constantly unfolding pleromas and multi-crowned monster dragons. Yeah, it, and it, it gets... It's visionary, right? And of course, there are, I think, important imaginal things happening there. Yeah, like the Connick's idea that you got, you're, getting, right. you're getting a different interpretation of the sacred, not as something that should be fixed, right. but as something that should be com con constantly transgressed. That's right. Which gets us back to the symbols. Yes. Right. Yeah, well, so the inexhaustibility and the transjectiveness. And yeah, when I read Seven Sermons of the Dead, that young book, I own it and I've read it a bunch. What I see there is not something that's easy for me to directly connect to but I can empathize with because I've had comparable experiences of poetry. I've had, right. I've had right. automatic right. writing poetry, things that, that came through me or that was the felt sense, right? Of course, at some level, I'm sure that biologically I produced it, but that was not the felt sense. The felt sense was that it was a thing that happened to and through me yeah. and that contained sort of massive right, archetypal structure to it. Yeah, there's a distinction that Tanabe talks about, about self-power and other power that's crucial to certain aspects of Buddhism. And right effort is about getting the balance between self-power and other power. Right. Um, so, I mean, you invoked transjectivity, you, you invoked, you know, inexhaustibility, you t invoked salience, so I'll try to bring it back to again. Right. Like you keep, okay, so I'll give the, I'll give the, I'll give you the, keep invoking the, the yeah, connections. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm teasing you. I'll give you, I'll give you the simple, the simple. So this is how I think about it. I, I wouldn't want to put words in Jung's mouth necessarily, but this is how I think about it. I think about, so, you know, you talked, I think, in episode 32, your mm -hmm. series about Montague and mutual modeling, mm -hmm. okay? And I, I often think about it in those terms and in type, what we're talking about when we're talking about typology. But in the simplest sense, I think about it in this way. There are a series of encounters that I can have within my own mind Okay, with figures that compose my psyche, but are not identical with the person I would call Anderson, but right. they're important parts of my functioning. Those include things like the internal mutual models I developed for my parents. Right, right, right. Who, you know, and this is a point that I sometimes make, it's like, well, that's an area where Freud was right, right? Theory of mind, we know that we have theory of mind for other people before we have it for ourselves. Yes. And under mutual modeling, we know that evolutionarily speaking, it's yeah. absolutely crucial that you be able to internalize your parents. Yep. Often, in fact, you, your enormous frustration as a young adult. You get a lot of your metacognitive abilities through from, from Vygotsky, right? right? But, and what, what you put those two things together, and what that means is your parents have been living in your head longer than you have. Yes. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. That's very provocative. Right? right. I mean, that, and in that sense, like, for And the effect, right. attachment, right? Or romantic. Right. Thing. So that's Jeff McDonald's work and other people's work. Totally, right? right? So, so you know, you get that. You get general, general kind of concepts of type. And to talk about type, people get very, you know, worked up about it. But really, type is just category. Mm -hmm. You know, and category is essential to doing any kind of abstract thinking, manipulating things in classes. That's type. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that I'm not interacting with every cat as a radical individual, but I have some basic idea of where a cat wants to be scratched and not be scratched. I might sometimes get surprised, <laughs> right, right. but for the most part, right, I form type. Likewise, we interact with type on a day-to-day -day basis all the time and recognize in other people, uh, even when we don't in ourselves, right, when we say somebody has a romantic type, and that's recently been put on empirical footing. People really do yeah, have yeah. a romantic type, right? right? And to say that romantic type is intertwined with people's pathologies of attachment and romance would be understating it, even, right? Can I interject you just yeah, sure. sparked an insight into it. sure okay so if we have sort of categorical relationships mm -hmm. is part of young getting us to not make a modal confusion and shift from a category an i it with our inner life to an i thou yes ah ah yes ah. that's why it's about developing relationships ah right so you come to a relationship and this is why um often i think people you know, the archetypes aren't things we 
have exactly. No, no, no. Right? They're they're and sort of they're somewhat fundamental structures, but the but the, the the fundament of the structure is that they will form, not the specific contents. And we have to encounter those specific contents in order to know ourselves. And those specific contents are best encountered uh, as people, sort of. Yeah. Not sort of. quite, but sort of. Yeah, vows, but not necessarily persons. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I'm I'm on the fence, personally, about whether these aspects of our mind possess that, possess our own subjectivity intrinsically, or whether it's the case that through the practices that we engage in, we allow them to draw on the machinery of subjectivity, whether we person them. Right. We sort of allow them to exact that machinery so we can right. enter into a more direct therapeutic relationship right, with them exactly. or something like that. Right, exactly. Like, so. If you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to do it Want to change the world There's nothing to it Hurry up, Violet! This way, Grandpa!